Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The program will begin in five minutes. Please move to your seats. As a reminder, please set your electronic devices to silent, but keep them at the ready so that you can text or email your questions to our guest speaker to the address on your screen. Ask me TNA at gmail.com. HII delivers the most powerful naval ships ever built. That same innovation and dedication is applied to executing missions in complex and contested environments. We are leading the next evolution of national defense 
the data evolution. That means anticipating emerging threats with C5 ISR capabilities that enable a deep understanding of the environment across a wide range of assets. And with AI and big data platform capabilities that support threat analysis and cyber operations at an unprecedented data scale. Preparing warfighters for virtually every conceivable situation they may face with live, virtual, constructive, synthetic training environments critical to the all-domain order of battle. Making vast expanses of the Earth accessible for defense, research, and commerce. On land, under the seas, in the air, and in space. With world-leading autonomy and the largest family of UUVs in every class, making transoceanic missions possible. Ensuring the world's most capable and resilient platforms are always at the ready. On the sea, under the sea, and ashore. Maintaining a safe, secure, and effective strategic weapons stockpile and executing complex environmental remediation through a legacy of disciplined nuclear operations supporting the Department of Energy's mission priorities. We do all of this with a talented, diverse, and innovative team that is driven to solve our customers' most complex challenges. HII, solving our nation's critical security needs by delivering the hard stuff done right around the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final keynote session of TechNet Augusta 2023. Prior to the conference, ASEA asked our network of industry partners to submit solutions to eight problem statements provided by the Army Cyber Center of Excellence. We received more than 50 responses and selected 13 to be presented this week in the engagement theater in the exhibit hall. We have published all of the submissions in a compendium you can find by selecting Solution Abstracts under the Program tab on the TechNet Augusta website. At this time, please join me in welcoming to the stage Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence, U.S. Army Retired President and CEO of AFSIA International. All right. We got to get to the good part of that song, guys. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for our closing keynote presentation. Uh, I think you all will agree with me. What a week. It has been absolutely amazing with the, the messaging the synchronization that we've heard, the alignments that have gone across all of the commands. Great panel today. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, Ed, as we do that. So again, it's our 10th anniversary here in Augusta, Georgia. And when we were first here in 2013, we had a little over 2,200 registrations. Last night, we closed at 5,924 registrations. So, I, I met with General Skinner before, before he had to leave last night, and I said, you know, we're closing in on tech debt cyber. We're only off by 150. He says, you tell that Stanton guy, he better not. Said, I'll, I'll do my conference. <laughs> but what I really appreciated was the support from the city. Uh, the mayor was very gracious, personally met with me, and he says, tell me what you need. And so as we're gonna look at what we need here next year, we're actually, they're gonna let us close down Reynolds Street and it's gonna become uh, the Reynolds Pavilion so that we can bring in more of industry that's on a waiting list. So we'll make that happen next year and then we'll see what he says. In fact, he even sent his council, some of his councilmen back over and made him walk the convention center and the floor and asked him, is it time for us to expand the convention center? I like that. So we'll see what happens as we go forward. Started off again today with General Barrett. Thank you, ma'am. Great messaging on data-centric operations and a unified network, unified operations as we go forward. The panel led by General Cardone. Great discussions, uh, great members there as we talk about the roles to enable a data-centric army. Great messaging there. 
Um, before I introduce our guest speaker, um, I'd like to again thank the local AFSIA chapter who always comes out in full force with the volunteers. Uh, it's a great chapter here and I really appreciated everything that, they hap that happened. Um, I don't know if um, Bob Damon's here, but I know that Eric had to leave for, for a meeting. But again, just great leaders, great volunteers here in Augusta, Georgia. I'd now like to invite Grant Hagen, president of HII Cyber, Electronic Warfare and Space Business Group, to introduce our closing keynote speaker. Thank you, Grant. Hello and welcome to the closing keynote and, uh, and conference closing at TechNet Augusta. I'm Grant Hagen, president of Cyber Electronic Warfare and Space at HII, and we're a proud sponsor of this year's event. HII provides integrated solutions that ena enable de decision superiority uh, and today's connected all domain force. Uh, these include full spectr sp spectrum cyber platforms and tools, big data processing and analytics, and other mission critical capabilities in the defense and federal solution space. Today I have the honor and privilege of introducing our closing keynote speaker on behalf of ASCIA International. Joining us today is General Jim Rainey, Commanding General of Ar U.S. Army Futures Command. Inspired at a young, young age by influential people in his life who had served in the U.S. Armed Forces, General Rainey was commissioned in 1987 as an infantry officer and has served in a variety of leadership command and leadership positions. These include Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, Plans, and Training at Army Headquarters, where he helped shape the organization he now leads. Named to his current Army Futures Command position in October 20. 22, General Rainey is focused on what the next evolution of warfare. Under his leadership, Army Futures Command soldiers and civilians are de delivering the technology necessary to ensure we have the best Army in 2040 and beyond. I personally look forward to hearing from General Rainey, and I know you all do as well. Thank you for joining us today, and thanks to TechNet Augusta for giving HII the opportunity to sponsor this event. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming General Rainey. That's bad. The uh, eight. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. I got the uh, coveted post-lunch last day of the conference. Uh, so somewhere, one of the many SIGOs that I mentored in the Central Corridor or Battlefield somewhere worked the schedule, and here we are. Just lucky if they don't turn off the mic. Uh, well, uh, to uh, the great city of Augusta and AFSIA and uh, General Lawrence, thanks for your incredible service in uniform. And, and uh, I have some great stories if anybody, they cost you a drink later, but, um, but no, thank you for everything you did for the, for the Army and thanks for what you're doing now. <clears throat> and Paul, thanks for your incredible leadership and your team and everybody uh, that made this possible. <clears throat> so. I'm an infantry officer. Um, I lost track of math right about the time they started putting letters into the math problem. So about <laughs> fourth grade, I decided to focus on liberal arts as a strategy. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk a lot of technical data stuff. <clears throat> um, but I do want to talk, not to insult anybody, but, but talk about war fighting and commanders. Uh, because I think that, that as we go on this incredibly difficult, challenging quest to make sure we deliver the kind of network that we're gonna need is to not lose sight of why we need it and, and what it's for at the end of the day. Um, and I, I'm not gonna talk, I, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about <clears throat> what I think, I can answer some questions, what we think about what's happening in our profession and the character of war. But I will say it's very interesting that at the same time, uh, it is incredibly obvious that some things do not change. At the same time, that we're probably at the most disrupted period of change in the character of war in our profession since at least since before World War II. So, uh, you know, airplanes, radios, and engines, 
and the impact of that on our profession this, this period of time is, is at least that disruptive. But at the same time, look at Ukraine, look anywhere in the world, uh, it is indisputable that war remains a contest of will between human beings, that people matter, uh, ultimately. And uh, much to the chagrin of some people, land remains decisive because those people continue to insist on living on the land. And I'm not being parochial, there's no air maritime theater, there's no such thing as a land theater, we fight joint theaters. But land absolutely matters, and it's not going to change. And that's good news for us because our asymmetric advantages as the United States military, and especially in the Army, are number one, our people, and number two, the fact that we are, are maneuverists. We do maneuver warfare, not attrition warfare. We don't dig trench lines and trade our most precious weapon system, the, the individual soldier, for, you know, we would look at that problem and do combined arms, all arms maneuver and solve it, right? So it's actually good and I'm an optimist, but we got a lot of hard work to do. So command and control war fighting function, uh, I personally think it's more of a system, system of systems uh, combined with other systems of systems. The future is gonna be a lot about <clears throat> um, the clash of our system of systems and enemy system of systems, right? So um, command and control is about the commander, okay? We, we, that's the first thing we gotta remember. The command and control warfighting function is the most important and it is entirely about the commander, one person. Um, and we can't lose sight of that. And that's important because <clears throat> the art of command and the science of control, you got to understand both pieces of that. So when I get asked about things like AI, machine learning, quantum, <clears throat> I'm all in. I think the potential, I mean, whoever figures that out is, is going to have an incredible marked advantage you know, akin to like the arms race, nuclear arms race, space race, it's that big a deal. But at the same time, there, there are things that computers are never gonna do. Uh, ethical decision making and the art, right? Like no computer is ever gonna do that. So as we go down this path very aggressively, as fast as we can, we gotta make sure that we are aiding commander's decision-making, not trying to make decisions for commanders, because that would be a disastrous mistake. You come to a fork in the road, uh, and you're, you know, imagine just, you could do it now, it's not even science fiction, you're in your tank, you're Bradley, you come to an intersection, and you got data-driven, AI-informed, screen pops up, says, hey, Rainy, 99% recommendation you go to the left, go south. Every, we know everything there is to know, go left. I would look at that and say, okay, if it's that obvious, the enemy has to know I'm going that way too, so I'm gonna go right. And if I was really good, I'd probably ask the computer to tell me how to go straight so I don't have to pick either one, right? <laughs> I'm a mechanized guy, you can do stuff like that. <laughs> um, you're not gonna ever teach a computer to practice the art of command. And we as Americans are not gonna walk away from values-based, right? We're not gonna walk away from the law of armed conflict. So the can I, should I, the taking of human life and the responsibility of a commander to not kill innocent people I don't, I've done it, some of you have, I don't ever see ceding that authority to anything other than my integrity and my decades of training and my moral courage and responsibility. So we gotta on one hand go as fast as we can, be as aggressive as we can, get as much out of technology as we can, but never forget that, that it's all, at the end of the day, it's all about the commander. I ask people, let's, let's, here's, here's what we need to do, simply. We need to have our commanders give them the ability to make more decisions, faster decisions, and better decisions. Those three things. More, better, faster. 
I used to say better and faster, and as I studied this, talking to a lot of people that are way smarter than me, there's, there's actually data, data-centric warfare, there is actually value in the pure number of decisions you can make and the pace you can make them. Um, <clears throat> we owe commanders three things. I always told all my great signal officers and network people, I need reliable, redundant voice communication between commanders. Not, I don't need to talk to everybody. Somebody needs to be able to talk to the, but I don't. But in a firefight, in combat, the horror of war, I, commanders need to be able to talk to each other. So reliable, redundant comms between commanders. The second one, I, I could talk for, if you give me two hours to talk about this one, I could do it, but common operating picture, okay? But we've lost our mind on this in some cases. <laughs> we, all of us. The key word in that is common, not picture, okay? Common operating picture. Big C, little O, little P. We got people that are, you know, anyways. There, <laughs> there, there's no such thing as a log cop. There's no, thing, no such thing as a SIP or whatever the common intel. There's just one common operating picture. The potential and the opportunity, this is again, good and bad. Imagine how easy it could be or how effective we could be at providing scalable layers of information. So now as a, you know, I'm a brigade commander, my cop was whatever my staff could cobble together and I could get distributed to the people that needed it. And once we LD'd, that was it. But now, today, I could sit in the turret of my Bradley and just, you know, I could have pre-configured, I could, you know, I could work and train myself, train my team, and I could just pick from a menu of layers that I wanted at any time. So build me the layers, but there's only one common operating picture. Every commander can tailor that for themselves. I mean, the potential is, is incredible. But there's only one, it's common. <clears throat> so you, the commander has to decide how much, can I, how much information can be common between me and commanders two echelons down before I fight. So the potential to do that is great. We're getting overly focused on the picture. If we're fighting somebody that's good and they can jam us and we're having problems, you know, and we're getting ready to do a river crossing and I've got to be able to get that information down to about 100 different people, then we shouldn't be real super ambitious, you know. But the, the commander's got to decide what level of information they think can be common two levels down. So there's really some thinking that. And then the last one is digital fires. Uh, we, we can't, we've built fire systems, offensive and defensive, lethal and non-lethal, that, that don't work unless you have connectivity. I hope we don't regret that, um, but it is what it is, especially when you talk about joint warfare. So the linkage, and people say it different ways, but the linkage from sensors to a commander to a shooter, effector, you know, it's not all kinetic, to a, a sustainment enterprise. So it's not, anybody says sensor to shooter, they're, they're 2017, the other five years behind the battlefield, right? It's the sensor to the commander, I say, but to the decider going to whatever's gonna shoot it and you have to, you know, just getting it to the guns doesn't matter. You gotta know whether the guns work and whether the guns have ammo. So that, that linkage, sensor to a commander, to a shooter, to the sustainment, so you know whether it's gonna work or not. If we can give commanders those three things, the ability to talk to their subordinate commanders, everybody looking at the same common thing, and then connect that kill chain like that, there's nobody we're gonna fight that's gonna be able to keep up with that. In fact, I think it'll have such a deterrent value, you know, because no, we don't wanna, you know, nobody's gonna win a war between the United States and China. I, I believe we'll prevail, but the, the objective here is to deter that kind of horrific thing first. 
And us having that kind of data-centric command and control system, I think will have an incredible deterrent, uh, deterrent value. Um, and then last thing on commanders, the commanders don't need to know everything. They need to know what they need to know, right? And it's on the commanders, this isn't bad staff work, but commanders, for you people in uniform out there, young folks, you know, start, start looking for problems with yourself is always a good course of action in life and everything else. But if your staff's not giving you what you need, it's because you didn't tell them what you need. Don't beat up on your staff. What decisions are you trying to make? What information you need to make it? Give me that. I don't need to know. I don't know. I, I almost need to know nothing about the sustainment enterprise unless something is happening that's going to keep me from doing what I want or I'm gonna miss an opportunity. Somebody needs to know where all the gas and ammo is, but it's not the commander. I just need to know if we're on track or not. So some of that, I apologize, it's a little pedantic, but, but I mean, we really need to view everything we're doing with, with the network in the context of what it does to enable the commander to command. And we've, uh, I was talking to General Lawrence earlier, and, you know, we've, we've kind of, for us older folks, uh, we've kind of walked away from some real fundamental aspects of that. I'll give you a couple examples, pace plans, right? Somebody my age, you know, I mean, it would be preposterous to start a military operation without having a really good detailed pace, you know, primary, all, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, so yeah, we, we gotta do data-centric warfare, but it's not gonna work all the time. So what's next? You know, we got to think about terrestrial-based FM, 5G in a box. Uh, I see some old people. Nothing ruins war stories like eyewitnesses, so I won't tell you any. But the, uh, uh, but sometimes tracer rounds are really, really effective command and control mechanism, and star <laughs> clusters, right? Flags on tanks, things like that. So you got to have a pace plan, and then the other one is. Camo, the responsibility to establish communications in the United States Army is from higher to lower. Higher to lower. So what I see happening is higher headquarters berating and wearing out their subordinate organizations because they can't talk to them, right? That, that's, not how we, that's not how we do it. It's on you. So you got to build your plan. It's your responsibility to extend your combo to your subordinates so they can focus on extending theirs. We've kind of inverted that. And, the, and it's, just, it's just, I always tell my guys, you know, wear out your own SIGO, not your subordinates. You know, that's, that's uh, a good way to do it. Okay, and then we know, uh, we know that staffs then control, right? Commanders command. Staffs control, so building the processes, people, pipes, technologies to enable staffs to control operations. <clears throat> okay, so that's a little basic stuff. I hope that wasn't too uh, uninteresting for you. As far as the future goes, the unlimited potential of AI right now, <clears throat> machine learning right now, People have different opinions on quantum. You know, it's, it's not really one big giant thing. I think we'll see different aspects, quantum encryption, quantum computing. They're gonna come in at different points in time, I think. <clears throat> um, but we need to be paying attention to that. But the ability to realize the full potential of any of those things requires us to move to a genuinely data-centric approach to the network. So. Even if all those things were possible now, we, the United States military and the Army, could not take advantage of that fully because our data is all over the place. It's not standard. We don't have access to it. We don't have it labeled. So <clears throat> rather than connecting a bunch of disparate systems, which is good and we need to do that because we could go to war tonight, we also need to be putting energy into thinking about what is a truly data-centric network look like in the future. And I think it'll be uh, fundamentally different than it is now. <clears throat> um, designed for adaptability. And I'm just the Army Futures Command. A lot of people got opinions and skin in this game. But if you ask me the characteristic I desire the most, I would say, Jim Rainey would say adaptability. Just, I just think we should admit that whatever I have today is not what I'm gonna want a year from now. 
So just admit that. Don't try and figure it out. You're not going to get it right. Build a system that the number one characteristic is the ability to change and integrate technology as an opportunity as fast as it becomes available, right? And that's everything from an institutional culture, I think, of adaptability to the physical mechanisms to move the bureaucracy, to move money at the speed of combat. So I think that's something that the senior folks in the room, me included, should be working on. It needs to be reliable, it needs to be redundant. Um, and the things that I would, if you gave me two things to design out of the next, uh, our, our network going forward, it would be complexity, number one, and cost, number two. So there's, adaptability is the king. You get credit for reliability and redundancy. You get penalized for cost and complexity. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not naive. I mean, it's a business, everybody's in business. But the amount of the speed of which you can be adaptable in a fixed, you know, if you're on a fixed income, you got to pay attention to how you spend money, right? So we want our resources to be moving us forward, not paying, paying bills, right? So uh, I think cost is, is and, I, and I, you know, we spend a lot of money on the network. I, I think we can be better stewards of resources in a lot of cases for taxpayer money. So I don't think it's a, more money as much as how we use the money we have. Um, and then the last thing, I'll take some questions. <clears throat> Again, good news story. No matter what happens with technology, the single most important thing is humans. It's the people, right? <clears throat> that's, that's our superpower, like I said, asymmetric advantage. So we need to look at the humans we have in the context of data-centric warfare. And, and before anybody tries to take my ranger tab, I mean, whatever we do, we cannot lose the ability to close with and destroy the enemy. I mean, the future of war is not going to be some sharp, sheen, clean exchange of precision missions. The, you know, the horror of war isn't going anywhere. So tough, high character, resilient young men and women that if they have to, can close with and destroy our enemies is, is always going to be the thing we have to have. But at the same time, we got to get a little little thoughtful about the workforce of the future. So when we say we want commanders that are experts at maneuver warfare, they need to be experts at data-centric warfare, just like they're experts at shooting tanks and calling fire, right? And that's going to take some work. You know, we have the best commanders in the world, making sure that's true five, ten years from now, we're going to have to make sure our commanders can do these kind of things. Um, we need to move the leaders of the army from where they are to at least, at least data literacy and probably into data fluency. And that's good news because the younger people are kind of, you know, coming with us on this journey, but the, the field grading up part of the army we got to build into our PME things like data literacy, and, and we got to figure out the people that need to no kidding be fluent at this. It, you, you can't have to find a signal guy or a cyber person to ask a hard question about technology, right? We're not going to survive in that army. And, that, and we'll, we'll be fine there because they're incredibly talented. We need to recruit and retain talent, and we're not going to pay people. You know, we pay, we got good packages, but. You know, fighting, fighting the war for talent with money, you know, we have to create opportunities in an environment where young men and women value being part of a great team, value doing something with their life bigger than themselves, and create those cohesive teams where people who could make X hundred thousand dollars will, will do it for less than that because what they're doing matters. And, and they know all those opportunities will come later. But the war for talent applies to us. The good news is my organization right now is 90% DA civilians, right? It's a pretty unique thing about AFC, which is a gigantic opportunity. Because I think the real potential to make sure we have the best data workforce is, is, is in our DA civilian workforce, especially the civilian expeditionary workforce, where we can just get people 
they're every bit as much a soldier. They just got better, better clothes, and they can do, <laughs> they can do the same job, a technical narrow job for decades. You know, ten years, master it, and then cycle in the war fighting uniformed expertise every couple years to stay current. So I think that's a huge opportunity of our system. Uh, like I said, we got to upskill the whole workforce without losing close combat capability. And, and I really think, um, and I'm biased because I, lo I love TRADOC, <laughs> um, I, I, I really think we got, uh, we got to rethink our career fields and career paths. And every time I'm here, I remember, you know, I grew up, we had Signal, now we got, you know, the, the way we built the cyber capability and workforce of the Army, I think, is a model that we need to look for. I'm not saying we need a data branch yet, but we have, we have an ASI that we just started for data for young soldiers. But I think we need to look at uh, MOSs maybe. Definitely think there's a handful of warrant officer career fields, you know, take advantage. The, you know, we got the superpower of the warrant officer, technical master, that kind of argues. Like I said, I don't, I don't think there's a, I personally don't, don't see a branch yet for commission officers, but clearly a functional area or two where we can move people in and out and develop that mastery. And then just a little shameless plug, you know, so AFC, I can't take any credit for it, it happened before me, but things like AI2C up at Carnegie Mellon where we're taking high, super talented soldiers putting them through one of the premier, no kidding, academic programs, getting them the academic uh, WASTA that you need, and then keeping them for a couple years to work on really, really hard, you know, no kidding data scientists. And at the same time, the awesome software factory down in Austin, um, which General Murray and uh, a few other folks, Abdul Sabani, our great CASA down there, had the vision for. So before we go out and start paying people, let's look at the 1.2 million men and women we have in uniform and see if we got a little talent there. And what we found is we got a lot of talent already. So we're on our seventh cohort of bringing young men and women in from all over, every branch, every rank, upskilling them. And the first of those cohorts is now graduating, going out to join the operating force. And normally, the Army I grew up in, we just studied that problem for three years and then implemented it for three years. So uh, General Murray and other folks, and really the leadership of the Army, said, hey, I don't know what we're going to do with them, but we need them, so let's get going. So we're starting to create that. that so I think we're eating the talent elephant from both ends. You know, no kidding, academic, premier universities in America, data science, data engineering, come down here at the bottom, leverage the talent we have now. Now we just need to grow so that the thing that makes us the best army in the world, our people, makes us the best data-centric army in the world, our people. And, uh, all right, and one last thing, just a, another one to throw out to challenge people, because I know we got a lot of great industry teammates out here. <clears throat> Human machine integration. Human machine integration. I, I think that is next five, ten years, that's going to be the most dis disruptive and evolutionary thing. <clears throat> and I'm not saying it just because the Army's getting smaller because of recruiting and things like that. The Going after robotics as a replacement for soldiers, replacing a tank with a robot, replacing soldiers with robots, <clears throat> I think that's, that's misguided. I think what we need to do, and all this can be done today, is to take the right combination of human beings and machines and build formations that optimize both. Offload risk onto robots, no more blood for first contact, right? Work goes to robots so we can optimize our humans to fight, to lead, to make ethical decisions in the heat of combat. And the combination of those two things are gonna be at least 
a dramatic evolution of the profession of arms, uh, maybe revolutionary. <clears throat> and we're going after that really hard in AFC. Our, our, we have phenomenal relationships and teammates at ASALT, the Honorable Bush and his team. I know a lot of them have been, they probably all left because they knew I was talking, but the uh, <laughs> incredible teammates, partnered, AFC, ASALT, Ricto, General Brito and his TRADOC team, General Pappas, we're gonna go after this. Think big, start small, go fast. And it's relevant to, to industry because the limb fact in doing that is not the robots or the soldiers, it's the ability to connect to them and protect that connection and do it in a way that is gonna meet the very fair expectations that as we do this, we maintain the ability to control it and do it in an ethical manner. And that's gonna get into AI-driven warfare, it's gonna get into the connection, the physical connections of those systems, standard controllers, open architecture. Those kind of challenges, I think, will be a focal point that we can leverage industry, academia, and the military to kind of continue to work together. So I hope anything of that was interesting to anybody, and I'll stand by for your questions till they give me the hook. Thank you very much. Sir, what strategies is the Army using to better collaborate with small, innovative companies? Where did that come from? <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, I, I, that's, that's probably a better question for uh, the Honorable Bush and his team. Um, that, that's really an acquisition question. But from a, 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 my fighting position at AFC, um, we, we have several initiatives to, to improve. It's really, it's not connectivity, it's the, the ability for a small business to see an opportunity inside the Department of Defense. So it's more a process thing than a connectivity. Um, and it is extremely difficult to, to do that inside a couple years. We have a thing uh, called AAL. Um, there's AvWorks, uh, Defense Innovation Unit. There's a bunch of DOD programs that are purposely designed to close the acquisition kill chain a little bit that I call it SIBR grants like that. Um, I would just encourage small, innovative companies to seek dual use opportunities, you know, things that have a commercial application and a military application. You know, I'm not talking about flamethrowing robot dogs and stuff, but <laughs> a, 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 autonomous vehicles that have a disaster relief, and, you know, the, the, where they can find dual use that gives them the ability to get going in the time it takes to make the transition into a big DOD program. And, and did not give up. The, the small innovative company, you know, what about the two guys in the garage? If the two guys in the garage got something that's good enough, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna work out. And this is America's greatest country in the world for a lot of reasons. One of them is capitalism, and they're all very good at this. The, guy, the young people that really have something find a way to get it to a mid-tier integrator, partner up with the prime, f fight their way through the bureaucracy. And again, uh, ASOL, the, the phenomenal PMs, PEOs we have are, are doing a lot better at that than they get credit for. But a lot of work to do, especially in software. Software is not, I don't think there's gonna be big giant primes in the software business. I think it's gonna be whoever can write the best app for the purpose. Anybody sir, else? Sir, what is Army Futures Command doing to make the Army more adaptable? <laughs> Great question. Um, <clears throat> a lot of things, actually. So um, partnering with ASALT, uh, there's, there's really three periods of time that matter, I think. There's the deliberate modernization, which the Army's doing incredibly well. Think FIDEP, POM, uh, you know, we want to go fast, but I mean, like things like a new helicopter kind of, I don't think the American public wants us to knock that out of our weekend, you know? I mean, there's some things that argue 
right? Replacing the Bradley, best fighting vehicle in the world, things like that argue for a pretty deliberate process. And credit, again, not me or AFC, but the Army has been on a pretty good five-year run, you know, of picking a handful of things and staying consistent in that space. <laughs> and there's a concept figuring out what's going to change dramatically in the decade, probably 2030 to 2040, because that second and third FIDEP is where the S&T, RDT, and E opportunities. But as far as adaptability, it's inside two years. 18 to 24 months, we absolutely need the ability as an Army to see something happening in the world, whether it's in the network space, it's on the battlefield, and turn that observation into no kidding capability in the front edge of our formations in about 18 to 24 months. And I say capability, kit doesn't equal capability. We should give our soldiers the best kit, but you gotta have soldiers that know how to use it. You gotta have leaders who know how to fight it. You gotta have a motor pool to put it in. One of the things that keeps me awake at night is modernization works and we didn't set the conditions to train on it at home station. It's another place where the cyber community has shown us a path. But if you want to drop live ammo from a quadcopter, uh, I don't know about you all, but I, I would just love to walk into some of the range control shacks I've been in in my life as an S3 and say, hey, check this out. This is what I'm going to do. You can just watch them, you know, lock up and go down behind the desk. So we've got to be able to train on this stuff. And some of it's national level FAA policy. So taking a holistic DOMO PFP look to it, to adaptability and, and focus and building the skills to do that inside 24 months is what I'm working with Mr. Bush on. And it's hard, but, but it's absolutely doable. Okay, anybody else? Sir, do you have any thoughts you can share on how best to align Army Futures Command and TRADOC talent to achieve 2030 and beyond? Um, yeah, it goes back, one, I have a great, you know, we have a great relationship. Uh, General Brito and I actually had coffee in, I think, Kansas. Or I, I don't remember where I woke up. I think it was Kansas. We were there this morning. And I, I, it's not because I was misbehaving. I'm just traveling. <laughs> it didn't sound. Don't quote me on that one, please. The, uh, but we had coffee this morning. It's, it's flat collaboration. That, you know, everybody wants unity of command. I mean, that's perfect. We'd all like that, but that kind of ends at about company level. You know, there, there, there's there's a certain amount of complexity that argues for the right combination of assigned and supporting and supporting supported. You know, our profession is pretty complicated. So if you look at Dotmo PFP, uh, General Brito and his team, doctrine. And our Army does transformation best when we lead by doctrine. I think we have the best people in the world in that space. Organizations, we kind of share if it's current or future. Uh, TRADOC is the world's best training and leader development organization. The Army's a leadership factory for the country because of them. Uh, material requirements is AFC. Material acquisition is ASALT. Don't forget AMC, our great teammates, General Hamilton and his guys, they gotta sustain this whole thing. So facilities, the whole people enterprise. And then fortunately, being in uniform, I don't have to do policy. That's the work of our great secretariat, but that's the really hard work. So our secretariat, none of this stuff's gonna work if we don't make some breakthroughs and get, get some progress in the policy space. So I say all that to say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole team effort, and I, I don't, you know, people throw that term around, but, but it's really about everybody having a shared vision of where we're going and, and putting the success of the organization ahead of themselves. And, you know, I think, I think it was President Reagan who said, you know, it's amazing what you can get done if you don't care who gets the credit. And I, I think all of us just embodying that ethic, we're gonna, we're gonna be fine. But we gotta do the work. Okay, you let me off easy. That's good, I appreciate it. There are many more questions, but that was the last one we have time for, sir. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, listen, uh, AFC is open for business, right? If I can do anything for anybody. Um, you know, I got great advice going into AFC about ethical behavior as a general officer, and they said, you basically have two COAs. You can either talk to nobody or talk to everybody. So. <laughs> Uh, 
you guys haven't worn me out yet. I'm still in the talk to everybody, but we got all kinds of ways to connect project convergence, gateway, experimentation, all of our labs, uh, anything we can do um, professionally to help anybody who wants to be part of this solution. I'm all in. God bless you. Thanks for your time. That was our final question for General Riley. Rainey, please welcome General Lawrence back to the stage. All right, that's the good part of that song. Got it. <laughs> you know, as, as I was listening to General Rainey and I, I, I reflected back on FC International's mission, and it is to bring the military, government, industry, and academia together to solve our nation's most complex problems. And, and we got clear guidance from you today, sir. Your message was, was very clear. And it really brought back, when I think about all of our, our panels, our guest speakers, our uh, events over at the Georgia Cyber Center, your message has made it all real to us and why it is so important that we get this right as a, as a unit. And I talked about that earlier. The way this team is synchronized and aligned is awesome, so thank you. Thank you for joining us here today. We know how busy of a schedule you have. And I told General Brito when he was here on Tuesday, I was ready to put my uniform back on. And with your message, sir, it's uh, just some great things that are going on. So in lieu of a speaker's gift, we're gonna donate, uh, make a donation to the Fort Gordon Historical Museum Society um, to, uh, to remember our history as well. So thank you very much, sir. So before I close the conference, I would like to invite General Stanton to, on stage to offer any final comments. I, ha I have to get up here fast enough before the rest of the lyrics kick in. <laughs> you know how that works. Um, hey, so, so first let me just reiterate my sincere thanks to, to General Rainey uh, for closing out the, the conference. Um, that was purposeful because I've had the privilege over the past several months of listening to General Rainey offer his vision of the direction that the Army's headed, and specifically where we're headed with our data and our network in order to support the warfighting commander. And no better way to close out the conference than on the note of why we're doing what we're doing. And I'm sure that you all took copious notes. He keeps it very straightforward on things where our priorities lie. And so now, as our industry partners, clear-eyed vision about the direction that we're headed and now helping us get there. Let me also say that our Army is invested. Commanders place themselves on the battlefield where they need to make a difference. And in this conference, we had General Brito, the commander of TRADOC, responsible for our people and our profession. He opened the conference. And our commander, General Rainey, responsible for the direction of our Army, is closing our conference. That is a message to everybody in this room. It's also a clarion call about the level of energy and effort that we all need to apply to ensure that we're offering the right capabilities to our soldiers, God forbid, we find ourselves in large-scale combat operations. We talked in the opening, simplicity and contact matters. We have to provide intuitive interfaces to our warfighting soldiers. They've grown up using capabilities. Give them something that looks and feels exactly the same because they know how to use it. Make sure it works. It's gotta be resilient. 
Commanders need to be able to talk to commanders. And when you can hear that there's no ambiguity on the other end of the net, you know we're going to fight and win. Add the challenge of low signature. That's potentially a unique component of what we're responsible for. Our enemies are trying to kill us. We have to account for that in our design. And I said in the opening, interoperable is not good enough. Integrated is the standard. If I have to translate the data 25 times in the critical path from the sensor to the decider to the shooter to the sustainer, then we're broken. And you all understand that. And now we have clear vision of where we're headed in our development. Let me say a sincere thank you to AFSIA, to General Lawrence, to General Fredenberg, my, my former wingman. What an outstanding conference. If you look at the metrics, the numbers speak for themselves. But more importantly, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm exhausted from the intellectual capital required to stay engaged for three solid days of true discussion, of solving hard problems together, not in isolation. And it has nothing to do with the socials, which were awesome and thanks to our sponsors. I <laughs> also want to say uh, a quick thank you to the city of Augusta. Uh, we can't control the heat and humidity, uh, pretty oppressive, but outside of that, um, our city and Mayor Johnson rolled out the red carpet. I hope you saw that. I hope you uh, appreciated it. Um, it will be even bigger and better next year. Um, I'm going to call a quick audible. Um, and if uh, Terry Rogers and Reggie Cook are, are in the room, are you here? All right. Hey, uh, I, I don't have huge tokens of, of thanks and appreciation, um, nor do I have a huge checkbook to write checks to our museum society but I do have a coin. Um, and these two gentlemen, um, Terry from AFSIA and Reggie from the Cyber Center of Excellence, orchestrated this entire uh, event over the past week. And I, I just want to say my personal thanks. And in my, in my final closing, everyone's got places to be. I know that. Um, mark your calendars. The 27th of October is the official renaming date. Fort Gordon will become Fort Eisenhower. Our new namesake, former president and general, is the absolute right person for whom to name the installation. An action-oriented officer that had great vision, that led both our Army our joint forces, and our nation to success. And so I look forward to seeing you on the 27th of October, pending your availability, as we invite the Eisenhower grandchildren, the Secretary of the Army, um, and all of our local friends to uh, uh, officially rename the installation. General Lawrence, ma'am, thank you for being such a gracious host, um, and what a fantastic event. I cede the floor to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, General Stanton. We, uh, we can't have favorites here at FCA, but we love coming home here. So thank you for your support. Um, we thanked all of our speakers, our sponsors, our exhibitors, our volunteers um, this week that made all this happen. But I want to personally thank all of you uh, in the audience uh, for staying with us and, and being part of this great discussion. Your questions were challenging and probing. Um, our sidebar, our networking was phenomenal. So thank you for all that you did for us here as well. And another metrics uh, that I didn't talk about, we had 250 industry partners here for this event and on the floor. So thank you very much for what you've done for us. So you're all going to get a, a, an email here shortly and give you the links that you can access 
our videos and presentations, but there's also a survey in there, and I would ask you to please take some time and give us some great feedback because the changes you saw this year were because of your recommendations from last year. So uh, we really do appreciate your feedback and be a part of it. So again, um, go to www.fcia.org. You'll see the full FCA schedule. I want to highlight one event. We're bringing back TechNet Transatlantic. It will be the first week of December in Frankfurt. And when you think about what's going on in our world, current events, future operations, that theater is important. And so we're going to go back and get this started there and take on, take on those challenges that we see over there. So mark your calendar for that. TechNet 2024, August 19th through the 22nd. Um, again, I want to thank you all. Please travel home safely, and I'll see you next year. Thanks. Thank you.